love you. And, um, and I was, would ask for a show of hands. I know we've got a couple of uh, veterans uh, that are part of our congregation, Candace and Chris and uh, Lewis, who is not here today, but uh, maybe since it is Veterans Day today, even though it was observed federally yesterday, let's uh, give a, a warm thank you uh, to those who served our, our country uh, with honor. And, uh, and thank you for their sacrifice and service. May God continue to bless them and, and all who are in service uh, to this nation. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting how things work out. I had no intention of this being a message in any way tied to Veterans Day, but it kind of hit me this morning. I was like reviewing my notes, and I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> that's kind of a cool a cool connection um, here, and even with what Jimmy uh, taught from uh, the, the parish uh, about uh, the bride being arrayed and, and glory and the beauty uh, kind of all ties in with what we're going to talk about today. So if you have uh, the church app, uh, you're looking for, since all the messages are, are uh, categorized alphabetically, you're looking for the one separating fact from fiction when it comes to uh, the armor of God, something to that effect. Um, and uh, all of the verses are there. We may or may not get to all of them today, uh, but as always, I like to have more uh, than necessary. So worst case scenario, you got something to study for the rest of Shabbat, you can go and continue uh, to seek things out for yourselves. So today, I think we'll start out uh, getting Josh up here uh, right away. We'll read from Ephesians, and then I will do uh, kind of the standard teaching, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, on uh, the armor of God and what it represents. And uh, we'll decide together if that is the fact or the fiction part, and uh, we will move on to what I believe Paul is actually uh, talking about more clearly, and I guess I just gave it away. That was a spoiler. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we have to always remember on a midrashic level, um, even when you know stories aren't exactly correct, uh, there's still so much meaning in, 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 in the stories that teach uh, deeper lessons. So we're going to uh, look at both uh, because both are, are valid and have a place. Uh, Josh, Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first mitzvah with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Your fathers, you fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but nurture them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to those who according to the flesh are your masters, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as to Messiah. Not in the way of service, only when eyes are on you as men pleasers, but as servants of Messiah, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive the same again from the Lord, whether he is bound or free. You, masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing, and give up threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the vows of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world's rulers of the darkness of this age, and against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having the utility belt of truth buckled around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of Shalom, above all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery dogs of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and requests, praying at all times in the Spirit, and being watchful to this end in all perseverance, perseverance and requests for all the holy ones, on my behalf, that utterance may be given to me in opening my mouth, to make known with boldness the mystery of the good news, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, it, that, in it may, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But 
that you also may know my affairs, how I am doing, Titus, the beloved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will make known to, to you all things, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our state, and that he may comfort your hearts. Shalom be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Yeshua the Messiah with incorruptible love. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> so I intentionally had uh, the entire chapter uh, included because as we have always been taught in this congregation, a text taken out of context is the pretext for disaster. Um, so when, he, when Paul says finally um, and then begins to discuss the armor of God, it's clear that it's tied to what came before. And uh, I'm a little disappointed that at least my children uh, didn't shout a resounding amen when it said children obey your parents. I thought for sure you guys were going to lead the way. But they do, they do. I just was hoping for a public display. That's all right. We love them anyhow. <laughs> But, um, you know, it, it's all about, you know, submitting to authority and, and, and doing that which is, is right, ultimately in the sight of God. And it talks about our service. If we are a servant to a master, we are to conduct ourselves in uh, essentially in righteousness, in, in, in all rightness if you will, um, not just when we're being watched, but always we are to conduct ourselves uh, accordingly. And, and likewise, you know, me and, and my family and, and Jimmy and, and his and, and Aaron and his family and David and Bethany and, 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 and all who serve in this congregation in one way or another, you know, we, the obvious implication is we can't just come in here and be all, you know, you know yes, yes, you know, <laughs> super, super holy and pious and then get out of here and, and just act, uh, act crazy and off the rails. It's, it's weird to, we're to be always uh, in service uh, to the king. Uh, and, and likewise to each and every one of you, even uh, the newest amongst us, if today's uh, your first day, uh, this applies to you as well. You know, we, we, we come amongst brethren and sistren uh, in, in Messiah, and, and it's, it's easy to put on the face and put on the, the facade of, of, of goodness and, and holiness and, and, and being good. And then we get outside, and of course, the world attacks the enemy attacks, and we're presented, we're bombarded, really, with all manner of evil and uh, disgusting and vile things over the airways. You know, Satan is the, the prince of the power of the air, and it's, it's no wonder uh, what's happening on television and radio and broadcast and internet uh, of all sorts, because uh, one way or another, everything's traveling through the air. Uh, even stuff that comes, you know, through the, the internet, cables laid at the bottom of the ocean, when it gets to our TVs, when it gets to our devices, and the visual is going out, and the audio is coming out, it is going through the airways to have an effect uh, that it was created for and intended to do. And we are told by Paul, uh, Rabbi Shaul, um, if you will, that uh, we are to protect ourselves with this armor of God. So, looking at it, uh, since I spoiled it already, from a midrashic point of view, you know, I don't know about you, but I always kind of envision in my mind, um, you know, gladiator style, uh, Roman, um, you know, gear of war, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> the costume, the 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 garb that's described here i guess you could easily uh you know if you're a movie fan you know you could picture the spartans uh, of, of greek fame uh, and and different armies of old at war 
helmets and carrying shields and swords and, and all kinds of battle armament. Uh, you know, so you know, the first uh, part of the lesson, and I'm probably not going to get them in order, so I'll, I'll just go from, from top down. You know, we put on the, the helmet of salvation. We can think of that as, you know, it's, it's in our being saved, in our placing of our faith and trust in the blood, uh, the atoning once for all uh, sacrifice of Yeshua on the execution stake, that we, we put our faith and trust in what he has done. And our salvation is in him who is the word made flesh that that protects our mind, protects our thoughts uh, and, and our, our, our intentions. Uh, we, we move on to the breastplate of righteousness and this armor that covers all of our vital organs uh, that as the enemy tries to, to attack us and, and, and our emotions and our, and our heart and and, and every which way that he possibly can from every direction that we are protected uh, by, by this uh, garment. And the breastplate of righteousness is tied to the Hebrew word sadik, uh, which literally uh, tra translates as acts of charity and kindness. We're taught uh, that we are to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his ultimate act of charity and kindness was the giving of his only begotten son. God, the Father, stepping out of heaven and taking on flesh and living a blameless and perfect life in our stead because it was not possible that you and I could keep all 613 commands our entire lives. It just isn't possible in the flesh, in a fallen state. It cannot be done. So he did that for us. That is the ultimate example, the ultimate um, act of charity and kindness. He didn't have to do it. He could have wiped this out and started all over again, but he didn't. He decided his plan, his desire, what he placed in us ultimately was too valuable to dismiss, was too valuable to throw away. You are too valuable for him to give up on you. That's the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth that kind of holds the whole thing together, of course, tied uh, inextricably from the word itself. Because the word is the source of all truth. It doesn't matter what we're taught by the talking heads on TV and the different uh, programming that's on there. It doesn't matter what we're taught in the universities. It doesn't matter what we're taught in the school system. It doesn't matter what we're taught on the street. The only thing that ever matters is what the Word of God says on every matter because it does speak to everything. And while it may not be a very specific individual situation, every situation falls under the teachings that are contained. God didn't miss anything. He didn't leave anything out. He didn't fail to see the future. He didn't fail to know what you're going to face and are facing in this life here and now, thousands of years after the cross. He knew. He absolutely knew. And again, that word is ultimately our only source of truth. And when we're confronted, whether it's by external voices or the internal voices that shout above the still small voice of the Ruach HaKadosh, we always have to judge it by the truth. That belt, because that's what holds it all together. And our feet ought to be uh, prepared with the gospel, the besorah, the good news, the readiness of that gospel of shalom, that gospel of peace. You know, it doesn't talk about a specific footwear per se. It just says that our feet are to be prepared with the readiness. You know, with the Great Commission, we are told to go, teach, baptize, and disciple. And Yeshua himself made it a point to wash the feet of his Talmudim. 
Because the first thing that they had to do was go. Our feet are what gives us mobility. Our feet is what takes us down our mind's chosen path. Heaven forbid, be it the broad road of destruction that leads to the wide gate that leads to eternal damnation, or whether our feet go and walk in the ways that the Father has set before us in his word, and we stay on that narrow road that leads to the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. And over and over in scripture, God warns his people through Moses, through the prophets, to turn neither to the left nor to the right because the slightest deviation from his plan can lead to disaster. It's a narrow road. I liken it in my mind to, uh, you know, gymnastics competition. And, and you see these, I'm going to say women, but really most of them are really young girls on these balance beams and they're so narrow. And it is amazing uh, to see the skill and balance with which these girls are able to not just walk on this narrow road, but to do all kinds of seemingly miraculous things. I can't imagine how one begins to learn to be standing there and then run on this thing that is barely as wide as your feet and flip around and do somersaults and, and stick a landing with such precision, but they do. And you and I are called to just walk <laughs> on this road that is illuminated by the Holy Spirit. He is a lamp unto our feet. And we are to go and teach, baptize, and disciple. We have the shield of faith that we're told of by Rabbi Shaul, which extinguishes the fiery darts of the enemy. Again, this all is tied in with the word because with the word, we can deflect these attacks. We can deflect and extinguish what the enemy says. When the enemy says, you're nothing, you're nobody, you're no good, you're a failure, you're a loser, you're this, you're that. You can say, no, I am fearfully and wonderfully made according to the word of the almighty God. You can counter the attacks and it defeats the enemy. It takes away the sting of those uh, darts and arrows and missiles. And finally, uh, the sword of the spirit, or I like how uh, Rabbi Cliff used to always uh, put it, that in, in, in the, if you take it back to Hebrew ultimately, that it, it talks more of the sword that the spirit wields. Because while you may be a wonderful student of the word and have lots of scriptures memorized, let's face it, when you are in the midst of an attack of the enemy, if left to our own devices, if left to the flesh, it could be so easy uh, uh, um, 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 to just start stuttering around in our minds or, or not knowing what scripture is appropriate and forgetting where things are. But the Holy Spirit that lives in us as a deposit for our forever with the Lord, he brings to mind the right scriptures at the right time. It happens. It always happens. You got to get it in there first. But he brings to mind what is needed. And the word is likened in scripture unto a sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive and cuts separating the bone from the, the connective tissue. It is it goes to the heart of the matter and gives us the success in battle that we need. When Yeshua, who was walking in our place, was taken to the wilderness and the enemy tempted him over and over and over with little bits of truth. But ultimately, just enough of something else sprinkled in. What did Yeshua always do? He always 
rebuffed the attack of the enemy with the sword of the spirit by saying, it is written. You and I have to be prepared in the day and the hour in which we find ourselves facing rising evil and hatred and anti-Semitism and all manner of sick and disgusting and evil and dangerous things in the world. We must be prepared for battle. And I am not talking in the physical, natural sense. Yeshua said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. He, scripture talks about preparing for battle. Paul talks about preparing for battle in the spirit realm because in what Josh read to us from Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even when it is a human being in front of us, opposing us, mocking us, causing us trouble in our jobs, causing us issues in our neighborhoods and in our extended families, attacking our reputation, attacking our, our relationship with the Father even. We can and ought to look at that individual in front of us with pity and with sorrow for they are lost. And it's pointless and of no avail to fight in the natural, that which has its birth, its origin, its root in the spirit realm. Account after account of the survivors of the October 7th attacks by Hamas in Israel. They talk about these I don't even like calling them men. They are not men. But they refer to them as animals, as demon-possessed animals with no love, just hatred. Scripture tells us we ought to pray for our enemies. This is why I love the fact that we support One for Israel. But the majority of our missions dollars, because not only are they based in Jerusalem, not only uh, do they have uh, an amazing ministry in Hebrew only to the Jewish people in Israel and around the world with only six to eight million you know, Jews in Israel, whatever the number is, they've had and this is a while ago, a long time ago, they had over 36 million views in their Hebrew only channel. And of course, they have stuff in English. But they were very biblically wise. And they minister in Israel, in Arabic, to those people as well. Because while some who are Arab and some who are Persian and, and all kinds of other ethnicities are not in and of themselves any more evil or good than anybody else on the planet. Clearly, the enemy is using some in those parts and that those branches of Abraham of Inu, Abraham, the father of all of us, Judaism, and the Arabic uh, people, some of them have been greatly deceived and are woefully lost and need Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah, just as much as any British person, as any Australian or, or Chinese or American, we all need this Jewish Messiah. We all need to be grafted in. And we all must pray first and foremost for the peace of Jerusalem. We must 
go to battle against the principalities and the powers and the authorities in high places that work and strive to draw the Jewish people astray into all manner of sin and idolatry and secularism and atheism. But we also need to pray for the enemies of Israel in the hopes that some will turn their hearts to the Messiah. There's some, some incredible uh, testimonies of uh, kids, uh, you know, children of Hamas and Hezbollah leadership and soldiers fighting for the other team, having encounters with Yeshua and giving their hearts to him. And that is why we must pray. Until Yeshua comes and splits the Mount of Olives, there will be no real peace. But until that day, we must pray for Jew and Arab and Persian and for all. This is our reasonable service. This is how you and I are going to be part of a kingdom of priests and kings in service to the one true king. That's the Midrashic view. And I want to show you something interesting. Josh, if you could come on up with, uh, we just added this the one this morning, Exodus 39. Um, or is it Leviticus? Uh, yeah, Exodus 39, verses 27 and 29. They make the coats of fine linen of woven work for Aharon and for his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the linen headbands of fine linen, and the linen breeches of fine twined linen, and the sash of fine twined linen, and blue and purple and scarlet, the work of the embroiderer as the Lord commanded Moshe. Sorry, while uh, you're up there, just go ahead and read um, the references, the two or three that are in Revelation for me as well, please. And then finish with Isaiah 61. <laughs> Thanks. The first one is Revelation 3, 1 through 5. And to the angel of the assembly in Sardis write, he who, has, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says these things. I know your works, that you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and establish things that remain, which are ready to die. For I have found no works of yours perfected before my God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If therefore you won't watch, I will come as a thief, and you won't know what hour I will come on you. Nevertheless, you have a few names in Sardis that do not defile their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will be arrayed like this in white garments, and I will in no way blot his name out of the book of the life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The second one is Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 through 9. A voice came forth from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of mighty thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, Shaddai reigns. Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And let us give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. It was given to her that she would array herself in bright, pure, fine linen, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the holy ones. He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said to me, These are true words of God. And then it's finished in Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to appoint to those who mourn in Zion, to give to them a garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the 
planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build the old waste, they shall rise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers, but you shall be named the Kohanim of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. Instead of your shame, you shall have double. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in the land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be to them. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. I hate robbery with iniquity. And I will give them their recompense in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their seed shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them, as they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with the garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the erect spring forth its bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I figured rather than having them come up and down and up and down, you read it in its entirety. So one thing we've got to keep in mind, and it's kind of, uh, you know, biblical interpretation 101 in, in Bible college, they, they teach that the Bible cannot mean something different today than it meant at the time it was written and considering the people to whom it was written. So, Genesis to Revelation is a Jewish-centered book uh, focused on, uh, on you know, God's chosen people, his plan of redemption for them and for all of us through them, adopted into the, uh, grafted into the vine, adopted into the family, and the land of Israel. So the idea that somehow Paul is giving an example of, of Roman armor and telling Jews that they ought to put on this Roman armor, remember, for the most part, Jewish people hated the Romans, hated all foreign armies that have occupied and and, and slaughtered their people and, and desecrated their land over, the, over the, the centuries. To the point Peter famously drew the sword in, in Gethsemane and, and, and just couldn't wait. He was chomping at the bit for an excuse to attack the Roman centurion. So is it possible that, you know, Paul did have this in mind. I suppose it's possible, but really, with him being, as I heard one uh, Messianic rabbi one time say, uh, that speaking of Paul, that he was the Jewiest of all Jews. That's how Jewish he was. And this Messianic rabbi was Jewish, so it was okay. <laughs> Paul himself said that he was, you know, the most zealous of all for the law. For Judaism, for his people. He was next in line to be uh, the Nisi, the, the, the head of the Sanhedrin. He was very, 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 very Jewish. And in my, my study, it has led me to a little different interpretation. Again, everything that I've said so far about the armor and the lessons we have to glean from it are absolutely valid, 100%. They fit, but there's something deeper. What was he actually talking about? And I believe what he was talking about is found in uh, Exodus, uh, I believe it's chapter 28 in its entirety, and Leviticus chapter 1 or chapter 2, I think it's chapter 1, where great detail is given to the priestly garments. And while Exodus 28 
gets into great detail about you know the, the colors that were involved, uh, the the coat of blue, and all the you know, the the different colors and the fact that gold was beaten so thin it you know was basically became thread that was woven into the linen garments at the root at the base of it all and it's more clearly depicted uh, in leviticus uh, than in exodus was was linen garments linen breeches that covered the loin down to the knee roughly uh the, the, you know the the coat and the the turban the, the head headpiece were all linen and i really probably should have printed out uh, i found an interesting uh, thing online talking about linen and its origins and how it is uh, grown and and you know how the entire plant is used from the root uh you know and how they're all grown very close together so they grow up very straight uh and and are, are able to be you know made into these very fine fibers that are then woven and twisted together and i'm not doing this justice if you're interested google it it's very interesting and i'm killing it but i don't mean it in a good way <laughs> but the finer the linen the whiter it is is kind of the main point of that part of the lesson so we are told to make sure our garments are what without spot or wrinkle there to be perfect there to be clean why we are called into service in the military whatever country a person is in they have a uniform they have a dress code where they are to look like one another in unity to the service of you know in this country uh the nation the people in other countries maybe it is in service to their king if they are part of a monarchy and whatever form of government they're in service to that higher authority you and i are called to be servants in service to the king of all kings, to the Lord of all lords. Our garments are to be without blemish. And if you think about part of the service in the temple of bringing the daily sacrifice and how impossible it had to have been to remain clean for very long, for with every sacrifice, and there was what, like eight, nine, ten offerings a day. There was a lot of offerings. There was constantly offerings being made and blood being splattered with the slaughter of the animals and with the sprinkling and the pouring out of the blood. The priests, by nature of the commands, the mitzvah of the Lord. They became very dirty. And while scripture doesn't record it that I recall or that I came across, I imagine they had to change often. But Yeshua, our ultimate Kohen Haggadol, our ultimate high priest, adorned his mantle, his garments, he was perfect. He makes it possible that the sin and the stain of sin and the shame of our sin is washed away in his blood. While the blood of our sin and shame stain us and ruins us and makes us ineligible to stand before the King of Kings. His blood has just the opposite effect. It washes away those stains, leaving us as white as snow and perfect before him. We're covered in perfect white linen. All of us, from head to toe, our, our minds are covered in this 
perfection. Our hearts, our organs, even our reproductive side is covered. Every sin, every temptation, every distraction, every form of idolatry, every form of lust and pride of life and, and, and the lust of the flesh and, and the lust of the eye, everything is washed away. And when we put on these garments, like Isaiah said, that you know we've been given these garments of salvation, there, it's, it's beged, um, I think it's Yeshu or Yeshi is, is like a, a different version of that, Yehoshua, salvation from God. And one of the other definitions of the salvation I thought was pretty exciting was victory. Our salvation, our Yeshua has given us the victory in every battle when we put him on because let's face it he is the word become flesh John teaches us and as we get that word in us it changes us it transforms our mind by the uh, we're transformed by the renewing of our mind Paul says in Romans chapter 12 our hearts are changed by this word we're defended by this word we win every battle in victory through this word. We must be clothed, and how do we get it? By studying the word, by connecting with the giver of the word, who is the word, in prayer, in tefillah, we join with him. And it is no mistake, no surprise, what Jimmy uh, talked about, the bride from Revelation 19 as well. We are adorned in him. When we come back with him in a gleaming, white, costly, perfect land, to forevermore be with our Lord, forever in service to and in union with our King, our Savior, our Bridegroom, our Master, our friend that sticks closer than our brother. This is I believe at the root of what it means to put on the armor of God because it is his word, it is his name that protects us, not the armaments of men, not things of this world like bronze and iron and silver and gold, but in the precious blood that washes our sin-stained garments to perfection in him. Every head bowed and every eye closed, please.